get led through this pet shop, right? I mean, really, it just looked like it had a couple of half-dead animals in it. You know what I mean? It was a really sorry sight. Led up the stairs at the back, go in there, shaven-headed monster sitting behind a table with his nine mil, right? And that's the opening gambit. That's how we're going to start the conversation. Him with his nine mil pointing at me. How did you get into undercover work, Peter? Well, officially, I started when I was at Scotland Yard, when I went onto the Central Drug Squad back in 1985, when I was young, fit and fearless, and walked through the swing doors at the yard with my shoulders back and my chest puffed out and was proud as punch. Unofficially, a few months earlier, when I was based at a CID office in Kensington, we had some information come in about a guy who was selling LSD. And the only way to really discover if he was or not was to go into an undercover role. And the guy was gay, a very flamboyant gay man. So I went to Marks and Spencer's, bought myself a string vest, slicked my hair back and tried to look like a 1980s gay fella. Um, rocked up at his flat. I knew the, the, the buzzword or the code word that I'd been given by the informant for, for the drugs got into his flat, had a quick chat with him, and he produced sheets upon sheets of LSD tabs, at which point I nearly gave him a heart attack because I told him he was nicked. Um, but that was all completely unofficial and something that a bunch of us renegade young detectives had done off our own bat. But about 86, 87, I think it was, when the Yard realised we were being so successful in terms of seizures and arrests mm. that they had to centralise it all and... SO10 was set up and then of course the recruitment and all of that became a bit more formalised after that. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose I just sort of fell into it really because I was a young cop. Uh, I wasn't a very good young cop if I'm honest. I was a bit crap at the uniform stuff. Right. Um, why? Why? Uh, I think I was too young when I started. I was 19 when I started and I didn't realise how young I was, how right. young a 19 year old I was. Because right. I wasn't so good at the confrontation, you know. I thought I could reason with anybody even when they were still punching me. So right. I had a lot to learn quickly, put it that way. Right. But yeah, I only got four years in when I got an attachment to the drug squad. And then just one of them looked at me and said, do you fancy having to go out buying some crack? Right. Which wasn't the question I was particularly expecting. And first time I did it, you know, I was sent to this knock on this door. Uh, yeah, this... But come on, how did you prep for it? What did you wear? And This is the thing, again, you know when I said I had a lot to learn quickly? <laughs> yeah. I didn't learn it that quick because <laughs> cause I was sent, they sent me to this door yeah. Knocked on this door and this huge guy answered the door and says, who are you? You're not a f student, are you? I f hate students. And at that moment I thought, actually I don't know who I am. I've got no idea. <laughs> well that'll do. Yeah, I'm a student. He says, are you f stupid? I've just told you I'd hate students. Right. And then he laughed. It, yeah. was, it was fine. And, you, know, you got a little hand, handful of little wraps and I got one of yeah. the wraps and I went back to the drug squad like this. There you go, I got it. So what did you buy, a rock of, coke, a rock of crack? Yeah, just the right. stone, yeah, just, just yeah. a little rock. That, yeah. that was all. And it was that easy, really. In and fact, what did they say when, when you handed it over? Well, as yeah. I was walking away from the dealer, he said, um, you take care now, don't get yourself arrested. Right. Which I thought was quite considerate, really. Yeah. Uh, and I brought it back, and yeah, they were very happy. You're at the, the street level, or starting at the street level with the purchase of the £10 bag, the £20 bag. We were going in at a higher level yeah. into the sort of wholesale and import part of the drugs industry and we were getting introduced yeah, yeah, time exactly, yeah. and time and time again, either by an informant yeah. or if an informant had introduced an undercover cop and it was a long operation, then the undercover cop might introduce another undercover cop. Yeah, yeah. There was always an air of menace with all these people that I dealt with, certainly. You know, they'd be very jovial sometimes and they'd have plenty of cash to splash around and we'll have another bottle of that or we'll have another bottle of that. <laughs> you know. Right, well, there we've got a big difference between the yeah. kind of work because very few of the people that I dealt with were jovial and, yeah, there'd be casual violence towards me and there'd be no one buying me drinks and things. So right. diff different level entirely, I think, but... But the level that you were at there and those villains you've just, just described, yeah. what size parcel or consignment would you be looking to buy in that situation? Well, most of the time, very small amounts. I was right. doing, you know, eighths of heroin would be my, my bigger ones. I mean, I did some larger jobs where it went up to a kilo for, for right. one job. But, but if I'm honest, I, 
I was an agent provocateur for them. Right. Anyway, right. they weren't normally capable of that amount, and it came back at 1% pure. Right. So you can see what oh, they did there. Word. But, you know, occasionally we got bigger, bigger amounts, but... Mostly Whereas was, I was buying kilos, yeah, like yeah. multi-kilos, yeah. the police would say, and the press would say, had a street value of many millions of pounds. Yeah. So, of course, a lot of it was in flats and luxury cars and maybe a hotel bar yeah, and yeah. all of that. You know, I was going to buy parcels with 50 grand, 100 grand, 330 grand on one occasion. You know, so, of course, it yeah, wasn't... Yeah. It wasn't I would say there was a constant air of menace, but it yeah, was yeah. often well disguised with joviality and keeping everything business-like. Where did you stand on the taking gear? It didn't... Well, I mean, if I'd had to take heroin, it would terrify me. Yeah. Um, and I had a few risky moments where that was close. I remember one guy in Brighton said, I don't trust you, you're having my blowback. Um, so he did his he did his foil, and his, and basically saying that I was going to inhale his his smoke. Yeah. yeah. So I just yeah, great yeah, no problem. Yeah. And just pretended to and didn't inhale. You know, right. I, like yeah. like Clinton claimed he didn't inhale. I just thinking, F I hope he can't see the smoke coming out the side of my mouth. Yeah. yeah. But and I that just was heroin, right? That was heroin. So I just right. went as chill as possible and relaxed and, and fell for it. So I never had to take heroin. None of the other drugs would have particularly worried me. I don't think crack would have done. I never had to take any of that. But no. I made a massive mistake, though, a massive mistake. An operation I was doing in a, in a pub. It was a long-term job. The main target was an antique burglar, major car thief, a big cocaine dealer. And for that job, to give myself something to talk about as much as anything else, I made myself out to be a connoisseur of amphetamines. No. And I'm clearly not. But, you know, I would talk about benzos and, and, right. and meth and the difference between hydrochloride and sulfate and all this kind of <laughs> So anyway, one day he came up to me and said, hey, you, I've got something for you. <laughs> and he held up this little bag of this pink toxic looking goo. Right. And you could almost see it dissolving the plastic in the bag. Right. And I had a moment of reticence go across my face. I must have done because he looked at me and I saw the moment suspicion go across his face. You know, those fleeting yeah. bits. So I thought, I've got to pour fire on that, pour water on that fire of suspicion straight away. So I thought, I'm going to have to have some. So I put some in my finger and put yeah. it in my mouth. And he said, you'll need more than that with your tolerance. I thought, <laughs> So I put some more in. And I felt that warm glow in my stomach and, and my heart rate started to go. And I, I was a mess. You know, I got out of there, got to the safe location, told him what had happened. I had to be driven home and... I mean, I knew enough about the drug to know I haven't overdosed or anything, but it was way more than a comfortable dose. Oh. This was anxiety extreme. This was absolutely horrible feeling. And I remember being driven home thinking, I've got eight cans of lard in the fridge at home. That'll take the edge off. Yeah. And as I finished Did the it? eighth can, yeah. I'm thinking I don't feel any different at all. Oh, any mate. different. I didn't sleep for almost three nights. Sure it was is. that strong. But my house has never been so tidy. <laughs> It was 40% pure base. Wow. I'd had quite a lot. Wow. And in my era, there was... A lot of the, the gangsters convinced themselves that if the man on the other side of the table doesn't take drugs, yeah. then he's an undercover cop. You know, and that was kind of... Yeah. With some of them, that would be their, their standpoint. Now, I didn't like getting stoned or you know, hoovering up Charlie when I'm trying to discuss business with people. But so often, we'd agree the business in broad terms and then rock back and there'd be a drink involved if we were in somebody's flat and all that kind of stuff. And of course, the gear would come out, be it predominantly cannabis and cocaine. Mm. Well, I practised and practised and practised at putting together a three skin, a five skin, a seven skin. So a joint made out of three, five, or seven. Seven skin? Or seven Sounds races. like a Camberwell like, carrot. Really, like, you know, it was like a proper, proper... Right, I could, I could really put together a proper joint, and I prided myself on it, and I practised with octo cubes at home at the weekend, you know. Yeah. That's kind of like how committed to the cause I was. But anyway, I'd take it, whatever it was from them, as they put it on the table, and the skins, or I'd produce some of my own, mm. just again as a little deflection kind of tactic. 
put the joint together. And of course, because I'm building it in my hands there, they don't actually really see where I'm putting the gear. So what I would do is I would backload the joint. So in other words, the front of the joint, which I would twist mm. at the end, and that would be the bit that I'd spark up, that bit there, right? Essentially, I hadn't put any gear there. Mm. And I'd backload the joint. So I'd say, well, I built it, so I'm going to spark it, right? Which was a bit counter to the culture of then handing the joint to someone. But I'd selfishly go, well, I've built it, so I'm going to spark it, put the joint in, smoke it, have a couple of big tokes. But essentially, all I'm doing is smoking the tobacco because I front-loaded it. Yeah, yeah. You know, couldn't always happen. Sometimes they would build the joint themselves and it passed pass around and it, you know, you would. But only if it was going to be a deal-breaker. And with cocaine... <laughs> Again, I practised for hours. I became very adept with a card at chopping up lines and then I could create initials, mm. right, with the, with the joints. And again, people go, oh, I've never seen that done before. And you just go, well... And again, that would deflect from me having to hoover up a £20 note and hoover up a line. Yeah, yeah. Because they think, oh, this guy really knows his stuff. That's, that's, that's cool. I, I used to hate being stoned. Yeah. If, if undercover, it was horrible, absolutely horrible feeling. That was yeah. really, oh God. Although once, once, <laughs> I went to this, um, it was a free party. So it was about, it's the, the rave scene, free yeah. party. And I got in there and I was with, with a colleague, woman again, and um, someone says, oh, do you need anything? Do you want some pills? So he gave us two pills. He says, how much? She says, oh no, you can have them. And it was a proper hippie free party. There was no big hitters in there. They were just kids and hippies. Mm. And so my companion, she says, there's no way I'm putting evidence in against these. Just, no, I'm not doing it. Right. I'm not doing it. Right. I thought, actually, no, I well, don't want well, to well, either. Because well. these, these are not gangsters. These are not yeah. criminals. They're just there for a dance. So, yeah. so I said, so what do we do then? She said, let's get stoned. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, all right. So we, we scored some grass and some resin and, and we made a, well, she rolled actually. We made a double layer yeah. uh, and we got stoned for right. the next three hours dancing to some really great techno. Right. Because I'm a fan right. of the music. Right. So, How did yeah. the debrief with the bosses go? What, what happened there? Well, the thing is, as I'm walking out, I'm thinking my undercover time's over because I'm like, really, still. <laughs> and we're both sat there trying not to <laughs> ourselves laughing, trying to answer questions like what do people look like? Well, they were sort of average height. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have those moments when you thought, am I going to meet my maker now? Is this going to be it? I've had quite a few, to be yeah. honest. Um, God, I mean, I suppose my most dramatic one uh, was I'd bought off this fairly decent sort of regional uh, geezer right at the start of the job. And this is six months later, but we've got no footage of him, got no corroboration at all. Right. So we were trying to wind the job up. Well, we needed this corroboration. So, but he wasn't coming out being hands-on. He was just sending runners. So I knew he liked his clothes. So I got some counterfeit Stone Island jackets and I, I tempted him out to look at them. But he brought two of his mates with him and I'd not met them before. So, what, so did you, what did you have them on a, on a rack or something? No, I had three or, in a bag. Right. Just three in a bag saying, right. look, these are an example. I've got loads right. more if you want them. And where did you source them from? Um, customs. Right, okay. So, so I'm in this car park and he says, yeah, do you just want to sell me these or are you after something? I'm thinking, well, I've not bought any crack from you yet. So if you've got any white, I'll have a 20 stone off you. Right. So he gets back in the car and he's cutting off this massive block, right. a huge block of crack right. with a little razor blade. And his mates then start saying, hang on, how, how long have you known him? How long? And he's getting really suspicious. He pushed me up against this railing right. and starts feeling down my jacket. Uh, and he finds the camera. So I'm thinking in this moment, you know, the adrenaline time slowing down thing. I'm thinking, well, if he convinces his mate, who I know, of what he's found, I'm in trouble here. So what I've got to do is to block that communication. So I just launched into this torrent of abuse. I says, what are you doing? Picking at my jacket. It's not even my jacket. I borrowed it this morning. What the f are you doing? Picking at my jacket. What are you f And I just launched at him. And of course, he's a bit shocked. Like, wow, I wasn't expecting that. And then he starts to doubt himself a little bit. And then I took the jacket off his other mate and started folding it as slowly as I can. 
moving in the, into the, and as I, then I start walking really slowly and over my shoulder, still just maintaining this abuse. So I've got to stop him talking to me. Get halfway across the car park, I hear this running feet behind me. I'm thinking, oh, maybe if I swing around, get one punch in, you know? Turn around, it's the guy I know. He says, I don't mind my mate, he's a And I says, yeah, he is a He's been picking up my jacket. Anyway, don't you want this, this ting? And I'm uh, thinking, you want to still want to sell me crack? Are you kidding uh, me? Uh, so I did the exchange, all nicely framed in the camera. And then I carried on walking. But then, of course, his mate managed to convince him of what I'd found, because I heard the screeching uh, of the wheels. Uh, and the car zooms across the car park. I'm thinking, no, nah, I need to run now. So I got running, got to the pavement, and I turned left to the side of the ring road. And the car followed me up the pavement. And it's roaring, trying to get me. Right. And I sprinted and I got to where the road sort of split, uh, where there's a roundabout and there's the metal railings. I just got to the metal railings, there was no room for the car. So it came to a halt. I looked behind, it must have been less than two metres behind me. So they almost got me, almost. And then it bumped on, onto the road, and went round the roundabout a couple of times. But from where I was at that point, I could walk quite easily to the pedestrian area. I was separate from quite quickly. Anyway, went back to the safe location, did the debrief, told them the no, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Yeah. Did you make your way to a car and then go to the safe location or...? Uh, no, I put a call in for someone to pick me up. Right. right. Um, yeah, so it was like a, like a farmhouse they'd rented for the, right. for the operation. Right. Um, gave them the number, the description, and the intel geezer went out, went out, came back in and he, he was laughing. Yeah. He says, I don't know why they didn't just shoot you, because there's loads of intel, there's a gun in that car. Right. And you know how really stupid things you find them funny? We're all f***ing ourselves laughing at that. Like it yeah. was the funniest thing anyone had ever said. Uh, yeah, but that was one of the closest, I think. They missed me by a bit. What about you? So I'm living in the witness protection programme at, at the time. So I'm under all that additional stress. But the job still wanted me to work undercover. And my mental health is on the downslope. But I'm not really aware of that at the time. Mm. You know, I feel like I'm really stressed, but I can still function. Go to Moss Side in Manchester, into this absolute area of chronic social deprivation. Get led through a pet store. What year right? was this, sorry? Uh, sorry 90, to 94, 95. Right, okay. Um, get led through this pet shop, right? I mean, really. It just looked like it had a couple of half-dead animals in it. You know what I mean? It was a really sorry sight. Led up the stairs at the back, go in there, shaven-headed monster sitting behind a table with his nine mil, right? And that's the opening gambit. That's how we're going to start the conversation. Him with his nine mil pointing at me, you know, sitting on the table. So I didn't really want to dwell there very long, as you can imagine. And I agreed far too readily to a purchase, a sample purchase of an ounce of cocaine and a kilo of cannabis, because we were going to do a, you know, bit of a jamboree bag of, of a deal, right? You can tell I wasn't operating at the peak of my powers now. Why on earth would I agree to that? Mm. Anyway, leave there, go back to the bosses, persuade them that they should spend this three grand. And these people were top of the, right at the top of the list of targets that Greater Manchester Police had on their radar at the time, so they were very keen to bring them down. Mm. So the three grand expenditure is sanctioned, and a few days later, together with one of the less experienced UC guys, they always wanted to be my driver because they'd learn how I did it kind of thing. And we pull into this service station, I just go, spotters, you know, because you can identify them, and you know they're there, and they're there yeah, to yeah. spot us. So they have got us from the minute we, we drive into the car park. And I then go and meet them in a, in a cafe within the motorway service station. Again, they make it clear that they're carrying. Right? And basically, I think it's fair to say that I lost my bottle. Um, but I'm really glad that I did. So what I did was I, I took possession of the, what I thought was the kilo of cannabis and the ounce of... Gave them the three grand and basically just got out of there as quickly as we possibly could. As we're driving down the motorway, I went to check the parcel. Newspapers or something? No, it was it was dung. The cannabis, the kilo of cannabis was compressed animal <laughs> of some description. 
and a kilo of cocaine was just some sort of white powdery nonsense, most definitely not cocaine. So of course, all the emotions that I'm feeling there, right, number one, I'm massively embarrassed because somebody who thought he was <laughs> like top undercover tech, you know what I mean, has just been had over completely for over three grand. So I'm embarrassed. I know I'm going to get one hell of a frigging rollicking when I get back. And I was disappointed for the, for the youngster who's driving with me because he thinks it's going to reflect badly on him as well. But I'm saying to him, no, 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 no. I will not have a bad word said about you. You know, this is, this is my error. But actually, you know, and I thought that fairly soon and I think it to this day, I'm so glad I didn't check that parcel there and then. Yeah. Because it would have just been a straight robbery. Yeah, exactly. They'd, they'd yeah. have shot me and taken the three grand. Yeah. That's what they were always setting it up for. There was no win in that scenario. None at all. So I'm actually quite glad. I now, unequivocally, without doubt, look back on all of that, the sacrifices, the stress, and it was nothing other than a complete and utter waste of time. Mm -hmm. Are there less drugs on the street? No. <laughs> Did we actually do anything really constructive and for the benefit of society? Well, some of the newspapers, their headlines screamed that, you know, this is a great part of the battle of the war on drugs, but it was all nonsense. Mm. Just a complete waste of time. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. At least 95% of undercover work and the use of informants is about drugs. So we're talking a drug war tactic mostly. And yeah, everything I did, it's not just that it was a waste of time. It's not just that we haven't prevented drugs getting to the streets. It caused harm to loads of individuals, vulnerable people. And you know, the level I was working, that's, that was part of my job. Yeah. It's part of my ruthlessness. But also made society more dangerous because our kind of work it sharpens the sword of organised crime. It makes them adapt and more efficient, more brutal, more ruthless, because they've got to outthink us and they've got to navigate what we do. That's a brilliant point. So we've actively made... Them better. Them better and society more dangerous. We've also increased the corruption because, you know, you catch a gang, yeah. it takes over, it's the rival gang, isn't it? Yeah. So a gang increases their power, don't they? Yeah. If they increase their share in the market, they've got more disposable income. If they've got more disposable income, they will always, and they do always, invest it in corruption. So the mechanism of the kind of policing that we've done has actively increased corruption. We're part of a growing worldwide movement, yeah, aren't we? We're, we're part yeah. of a growing worldwide movement of police and other law enforcement who want an evidence-based drug policy, who want an end to this ridiculous war on drugs. You know, with, with what, how the police deal with drugs now, do you think there could be do things done differently that would influence politics, or is it up to the cops to do that? Well, I don't think um, the responsibility to change our drug laws and to uh, move away from the nonsense prohibition world that we live in at the moment is entirely the responsibility of the police. Mm. Their responsibility is to enforce the law yeah. and not change it. But you and I both know that there are a growing number of voices within policing mm. that think it is a nonsense. And in many regards, policing has already decided that possession of cannabis is going to be decriminalised because I increasingly hear stories of small amounts being seized and dropped down a drain, for example, rather than somebody being issued with some community punishment or a public spaces protection order. But legalisation and regulation is the only answer. Yeah. There is no other answer. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Regulation is the way to take control away from criminal organisations. It is down to the politicians and we have to keep influencing them. But I think it's also important to know how policing can influence public opinion because, you know, the police are showing the public seizures all the time. They're showing seizures of, you know, the big blocks of cocaine or cannabis grows. And if it's not in the media, it's on social media. And the trouble is the public see that and they think, oh, well, the current system must be working because look at that big pile of drugs. Look at that gang the police have, arre have arrested. The fact is that none of those seizures have caused anyone to go without their drug of choice. None of those seizures have reduced crime and none of those seizures has made society safer. 
Now, when police institutions start being honest about the impact of those arrests and those seizures, well, we'll get change quicker. So, it, so there is a responsibility on policing. Yeah, but that's Turkey's voting for Christmas, isn't it? Because the police are not going to say seizing drugs is a complete waste of time because <laughs> that's how they justify their existence. I mean, I went to a meeting of our local Safer Neighbourhood policing team and top of their arrests were drug dealers. Three people arrested, all that kind of stuff. They, 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 they don't show the void they've created being filled by other criminals and therefore an increase in crime and quite potentially an increase in violence. They don't, that doesn't get recorded anywhere. No, it doesn't. And yet we see it played out. We see yeah. it played out with the increase, with the knife crime epidemic, you know, young people using knives. Most of that is connected to the illicit drug market. Most of it, quite, quite, quite basically, that is, that is the truth. It's not reported in that way. They talk about knife crime in this sort of isolated concept. This is about the drug markets. It's about prohibition. The murders, I mean, we, we, we've been... Of all days. Yeah. Today, of all days, the finest example, tragic example, of the folly of allowing criminals to run the fourth biggest industry in the world, yeah. the illegal drugs market, yeah. bigger than textiles, yeah. And we've all got, we're all wearing textiles, every single person watching, listening. Yeah. And we've all got a wardrobe and the industry is bigger than that. Today, tragically, Thomas Tommy Cashman mm. will be sentenced for murdering Olivia Pratt Corbell, that beautiful nine-year-old girl who died in Liverpool in mm. August of last year. He, a self-confessed drug dealer, set out that night to shoot another drug dealer. Word on the street tells me the dispute was all over drugs. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, Olivia dies. That is, a, her death is a direct result, primarily of Thomas Cashman's actions, of course, but also the fact that we leave violent criminals who possess guns to run this global industry. Yeah. It's so nonsensical that if it hadn't been thought of it wouldn't be thought of now would it you wouldn't no, go no. you wouldn't go let's get all the most dangerous people on the planet and give them a massively lucrative industry yeah it's so absurd isn't it, it yeah it's just beyond beyond stupid well, i remember one one occasion we dropped off uh, five million in the boot of a car to some colombians who on a friday and they came back and uh, on the Monday morning, you know, they dropped us some other stuff off in another car. And they come back Monday morning and asked us where the money was. And they'd been driving about Amsterdam all day, well, all weekend with £5 million in cash in the boot. They didn't even know it was there.